All right. Good morning. Andy and Vicky here. I'm Andy. That's um, Vicky. And we are just going to bring some music to you and hope you join along with us. Um, let me begin with scripture this morning. Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-string lyre and the metal melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord, how profound your thoughts. Senseless people do not know, fools do not understand, that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will be destroyed forever. But you, Lord, are exalted forever. That's Psalms 92, 1 through 8. Who was 
by faith in him as the only way to, to salvation. Uh, but still, that's not the topic I struggle most with. Similarly, the topic isn't money. Although I'll admit, I struggle preaching to you about your finances. Uh, people too often say, that's all the church wants. It's your money. And they're always talking about money. Get us more, more, more money. And I don't want people to think that's what we're about. Does it take money to run a church? Yes. And 
Jesus spoke more about your attitude and your use of money than any other topic. Almost as if how you use money directly reflects on who you truly are. Yeah, no, that's not one of my favorite topics. Uh, but again, not my most difficult. No, it's neither of those, you know, which are admittedly uncomfortable topics for me. Um, but neither are, is it any of the age-old questions. You know, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there so much pain and suffering and evil in the world? You know, can I trust the Bible? What about evolution? What about homosexuality? What about politics? You know, honestly, I'm pretty confident on, on, on those. I, and I'll even go so far as to say I'll sit down with you and we can talk about, you know, the, the heavy hitters like predestination and free will. You know, can you ever lose your salvation? How about the, did God really command the Israelites to go and kill everyone, everything down to women and infants? I mean, I can handle all of that. No, the topic that we're going to start digging into and that I truly have the least comfort, the least uh, consistent experience of, that, that's good, consistent experience, is joy. Uh, hopefully I'm not the only one who struggles with, with joy. Um, joy is that elusive thing that we as followers of Christ are all supposed to possess by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's that thing that Jesus specifically prayed that we would have his joy. But I have to tell you, I'm not there all of the time. Joy too often I find is a battle. And that puts me in something of an uncomfortable, even vulnerable position as I come to teach God's word on the subject. And yet, as Paul wrote, I feel compelled to speak. I have for a while, and God's been working me up into this. And apparently, He intends for us to deal with and understand the joy of the Lord. And as I look around and the delays and the ways I've tried to put this off, I mean, what more perfect timing is there uh, than now with all that's going on around us. So, so friends, pray for me because this is a struggle for me. Um, we were at men's conference a few weeks ago and, you know, we could still meet and do things. And David Manor pointed out at that conference that uh, we pastors, we are totally confronted by God about the things we preach to you on any given week. And, and I'm just telling you, especially for me, it is true on this topic over the last, you know, I'd like to say weeks, months, but really years. I have been before the Lord trying to come to an understanding about joy. So I'm going to pray for all of us. I'm going to ask that you pray for me. And we can all pray for God to open the eyes of our hearts uh, to the truth he wants us to understand about joy. Let's pray. Father God, I start by coming and just confessing that I am wholly inadequate to the task of proclaiming your word. And, and that is especially true today, Lord. And I'm especially aware of that truth as I come to the topic, as we come to the topic of joy. So Father, I thank you for that awareness. I thank you for making ever more clear to me today that I have no means to do this, but your spirit move and you speak. And so, Father, I ask that you do that. I ask that you guard your word. Let what is said today speak to all of us, me as much as any, Father. Guard your word and let only your word and your truth uh, carry through. Lord, speak by your spirit. Pour your spirit out on us that we would hear, that I may speak. And Father, I even ask where we are without understanding still, where we still struggle and don't get it, Lord, still let your joy be in us today and going forward. I ask in Jesus' name.
Amen. So I guess I should start with asking a question. What is joy? What is joy and what is it not? I think our world today equate, equates joy with happiness. It is uh, happiness with an absence of anxiety. If you would, I think worldly joy would even have its own theme song. It's Hakuna Matata. You know, you know what that is. What is Hakuna Matata? Well, it means no worries, right? No worries for the rest of your life. It's a problem-free philosophy. Or to sum it up, it's happiness unaffected by circumstances. The American Heritage Dictionary defines joy as intense, ecstatic happiness. Even Webster says that joy is the emotion evoked, called forth by well-being, success, good fortune, or the prospect of possessing what you desire. So basically, the world sees joy as super happiness based on good things happening or the possibility of getting what you want. That sound about right? Sound like what the world says of joy? What do you want to bet that God's word means something a bit different about joy? So what does the Bible say joy is and joy is not? Well, first, the Bible says joy is a gift from God. Galatians 5, 22-23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So joy is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. It is a produced result of the work of the Holy Spirit within the Christian's life. Life And therefore, it is a gift that we receive within ourselves. So how does the Holy Spirit then do His thing within us, right? And why does it matter? Well, why it matters that it's a gift and we have to receive it is because that means we cannot manufacture joy on our own. Joy, biblical joy, only comes from the Holy Spirit, and therefore we first have to learn how to cooperate with the Spirit so that we may continually and consistently receive that gift. We're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. What else does the Bible say about joy? Well, joy is not dependent on circumstances. Now, that might seem obvious. I mean, we just stated that joy is a fruit of the work of the Spirit in our lives. But in practice, I know that the struggle to hold on to joy in the face of circumstances is hard. But the Bible does not present that as, as a necessary truth. I do not have to allow my circumstances to affect my joy. But the truth is, I do. We do. We just don't have to. Just like we have to learn to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to receive the gift of joy, we have to learn how to resist allowing the circumstances of our world to take away our joy. Maybe you remember Nehemiah. We talked about him the other day. He was that man who the king of Persia sent home to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And so he went and he gathered all of his people. And there weren't a whole lot of them, but there was a huge job. The problem was they were surrounded by people who did not want the wall rebuilt. And he told his people, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So this, this community, this, this very small nation in the middle of enemies would build the wall around Jerusalem laying stones with one hand and holding a weapon with the other. Guys, that's a difficult and stressful circumstance. And yet... There is still joy. In fact, Nehemiah is telling us in the midst of that, the joy of the Lord is the source of the strength that you need to make it through. 
to make it through their circumstance, to make it through our circumstances. Other examples, James 1, 2-3. James says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. What? Yes, when you encounter various trials. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Or how about James 1, 12, the end of that chapter. Blessed, literally happy is the man who perseveres under trial. He must not be having to stay at home 24-7. Why? Because once he's been approved, once he has endured, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Or how about Philippians 2, 17-18? But even, this is Paul, even as I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. Again, Paul is in prison. He is awaiting death. He is being poured out. What's he say? I rejoice and I share my joy with all of you. Likewise, yeah, I'm facing death. Yet likewise, you should rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Prison, trials, danger, and yet in all of them, God's joy is still available. It is not dependent on on the circumstances. In fact, it should rise over the circumstances. So joy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, not dependent on circumstances. So what then if I've lost his joy in the midst of events? What does that mean has happened? What if, what if the circumstances are, are hanging over me and my joy has fled? It's not that the circumstances have destroyed my joy. It means I'm distracted, I'm overwhelmed by the circumstances, and I have allowed them to come between me and cooperating with the Holy Spirit that I might continually receive the gift of that joy. Man, so how do we keep that from happening? How, how do we hang on to that joy? We're almost there. One more point first about biblical joy. Biblical joy is a gift from God. Biblical joy is not dependent on circumstances. And here we go. Biblical joy is a response to experiencing the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, I know as Baptists, we don't traditionally consider ourselves catechists. Uh, that is to say, we don't teach catechisms as doctrine. So much so, you probably don't even know what a catechism is and what I'm talking about. Let me sum up. A catechism is a condensing of biblical truth into a simple statement of doctrine. Now, I mention that because I have often quoted this one piece out of the Westminster Catechism because it is so profoundly accurate. It goes like this, the chief end of man, or in more modern English, the highest purpose of humankind is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Our highest purpose, our highest purpose is to glorify and enjoy God forever. Personally, I like the next step. I'm struggling with this, but John Piper takes it one step further, changes one word in that quote. What's he changed? He says, mankind's highest purpose there, our chief end is to glorify God by enjoying Him forever. And if you will allow your mind to digest that statement for a while, you know, maybe a few weeks or months or like I have years, and you'll wrestle with it, I think you will find like I have, that you're facing a, a faith and a heart stretching, a growing struggle as you come to understand that your highest purpose is to glorify and enjoy God. Honestly, I don't see how any Christian who loves Jesus and actually bothers to read their Bible can miss that our highest purpose is to glorify God. We get that. Your highest purpose is to bring glory to God the Father through God the Son. It is there, it is obvious, it is clear. And yet, the truth that follows in and from that 
which apparently used to be clear. Whoever wrote this catechism got it. And apparently it was clear enough that the whole church agreed this is our statement of faith. And yet we've lost that second half so, so much in our churches. Your highest purpose is to enjoy God. I think we get a little uncomfortable in even hearing it said that way. But that statement is just as equally biblically true as the other. Your chief end, your highest purpose is to enjoy God. Yes, within the context of bringing Him glory. Or we can flip it back to its proper order. Your purpose your highest, greatest purpose is to bring glory to God within the context of enjoying Him. So yes, biblical joy is a response to experiencing the glory of Jesus our Lord. All right, let's put all these pieces together in one definition then of biblical joy. Biblical joy is an emotion within the Christian given, gifted by the Holy Spirit apart from the circumstances of life that is a response within us to experiencing the glory of Jesus our Lord. And that means to have His joy. To have his joy made full in us just like he prayed for. We do have a part to play in that. I mean, do you find like I so often do that your joy meter is really, really low? I'm not saying you don't love Jesus. I'm not saying I don't love Jesus. I'm saying we allow ourselves to lose sight of him. We allow circumstances or other emotions like fear and worry, we, we allow those to distract us. Is it any wonder that we find ourselves running on dry, on, on fumes, that rather than our cup overflowing, I mean, it, it hardly has a drop to come out. What does that definition then tell us is the solution? What, what can we do? Go to Jesus. Go and experience the glory of our Lord. So the last question of our today then is how? How do we experience the glory of God so that we might enjoy Him and He is glorified by that? Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart, namely more of Himself. Luke 15, 7 and 10 shows us that repentance from sin brings joy in heaven. Why? Because it glorifies Jesus. That means repentance can bring us joy as well. Why? Because he wants his joy in us. Repentance brings joy. 1 Peter 4, 13 tells us how our certain hope of a future glory in and with Jesus brings us joy. John 15, 11 reveals that the Lord's word brings joy. Well, of course it does. Jesus is the word become flesh. Glory be to God. Uh, John 16, 24. This is big. John, God. Jesus connects prayer, asking and receiving things in his name with having his joy in us. Prayer can bring joy. 1 John 1, 1 through 4 declares the joy found in the presence and fellowship of believers. That's us when we meet together and we worship God together. Oh, I miss that. I can't wait till we can do this again. But he, he writes on it and he says, complete joy, our complete joy found where in fellowship with the Father, with the Son, the Holy Spirit, and one another. Luke 15, Philippians 4 all tell us that conversion brings joy. Being converted and seeing people converted. Knowing that those you have mentored and loved and led in the Lord are still walking in the truth brings joy. Third, uh, third John 4. 2 Corinthians and Hebrews teaches us that giving brings joy. Many places talk about doing God's will, bringing joy, expressing our love for Jesus brings joy. So, so many verses. 
throughout all the Bible where the glory of God and Jesus Christ is exalted and the result right after is our joy. Our highest, greatest, and most important reason to exist is to glorify Jesus and enjoy Him forever. To glorify Him by enjoying Him forever. So if that's true, if experiencing the glory of Christ causes joy to be poured out by the Holy Spirit on our lives. Let's give that a test. Let's close as I read Scripture. Sit back, close your eyes if you wish, and just allow me to proclaim the Word of God over you. And let's see if lifting high the glory of Christ leads to joy in our hearts today. The Lord, Yahweh Adonai, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps his loving kindness, his covenant love for thousands, who forgives all types of sin and yet by no means leaves the guilty unpunished. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who, have, who has displayed your splendor, your glory above the heavens. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, the heavens are telling the glory of God. Their expanse is declaring your work. Day by day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, and yet their voice, their voice has gone out to all the earth and, and the word has gone to the end of the world. O oh Lord, you are my shepherd. Because of you, I shall not want. You make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me by quiet waters and restore my soul. You guide me in paths of righteousness for your own name's sake, your glory. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and your loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before the Lord like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look on him, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised. He was forsaken of men, a, a man of sorrows, acquainted with, with grief. And like one from whom we hide our face, he was despised. And yet surely our griefs he has borne, our sorrows he carried, and yet we ourselves looked and considered him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our sin. And the chastening of our well-being, the correction, the punishment, the, the wrath of God fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turning his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity, the sin of all of us to fall on him. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, He was there with God, and all things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing that exists has come into being. In Him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. And that Word... That word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And for of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. He has revealed Him. 
This is the testimony of John. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John testified saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven and He remained upon Jesus. This is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I have myself seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. And yet, Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate said, you are a king. You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was able to open the book or even look into it. And so I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book. But one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who has overcome so as to be able to open the book and his seven seals. And I looked and I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and the elders, I saw a lamb standing, and yet he looked like he had been slain. He had seven horns and seven eyes, and there were seven spirits of God sent all over the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he took the book, the four living creatures of the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you, worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased from God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And then they all said in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing, and every created thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, I heard them say, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. <sighs> I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I, Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star, and yes, I am coming quickly. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.